Father, we come to you here for this midweek service to once again worship you and give you the honor and praise and glory that you're due. Father, we thank you for rest you've given us. We thank you for the things we've gotten done this week. Let's pray for your continued blessings for the rest of the week. And as we prepare to celebrate Independence Day tomorrow, that, that uh, Lord, we know what this nation was truly founded on. It's, it's gone far and far away from, from what you provided for us. Originally, this nation was founded upon you, and it was only because of you that we, we had this once great nation. But this nation has, has quickly gone down the tubes, and it's just been turned over to Satan. And so, Father, we just pray that you'll convict not only the leaders, but the, all the way down to the uh, lowest little person here on, on this nation, because this nation, it's just, like I said, it's turned over to Satan. So we pray that, that you'll convict them so that they'll turn to your son, Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that's going to turn this nation around and make it great again. And so, Father, we just pray that, that you'll uh, give wisdom to the leaders to make the right decisions according to what your word says and not according to what their plan is for the one world government and the Antichrist and everything else. And so, Father, we just pray that you bless this service. Be with your servant. Just uh, give me the words and understanding as we continue our study in Daniel to properly be able to pre uh, teach the people and and. We know that these events are going to be unfolding soon. We do pray, even so come, Lord Jesus. We pray, Lord, that you'll continue to bless those that are out there making a stand for the King James Bible and out there trying to win souls, whether it's through tracks or uh, street preaching or whatever it may be. We just want to pray for all those various ministries. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> We're going to be continuing our study in Daniel. This will be Daniel part 45. Now we're in Daniel chapter 6. <coughs> this is the chapter of Daniel and the den of lions. You know, Daniel gets placed into the den of lions. It, uh, quickly, just a reminder, then we're going to be picking it up in, in verse 14, but that, um, you know, Daniel, he had been made, you know, Darius was the king and well, the Medo Persians after they had conquered the. Uh, Babylonian Empire, and Darius had 120 princes in his provinces all divided up, so he had a, had a prince over each one of those provinces, 120 of them. Then he had three presidents that were above those, and of those three presidents, Daniel was the top of the three, so he was above all these people. Well, these people were jealous because he was in charge, plus they just didn't like Daniel. You know, they, he, he didn't served the same God, false gods like they did. And, and so they had schemed up this plan to try to get rid of Daniel. Remember, Daniel was around mid-80s here at this point. And so they, they wanted to try to get rid of this guy. So they come up with this scheme, and they go up to the king, and they tell him that all of us have gotten together, and we've all agreed that you need to sign this law and effect that for 30 days that no one can make a petition to any god or any man other than you, king. Because they knew that Daniel, he prayed three times a day to his god. He never tried to hide it. And, and they knew he was loyal. He was not going to stop doing what he was doing just because of this law. So they knew that they knew they could, they could said they couldn't find any fault in him. They knew that's what they were going to do. And so sure enough, the king falls for it. He signs it. Doesn't even question where's Daniel, what did Daniel's opinion have to mean or anything else. And then, you know, the, the Persians and the Medo-Persians, they had a stupid law that, what, you know, when a king made, made a law, then even the king himself could not overturn that law. And I mentioned how in Esther that, uh, you know, the same thing happened. They had to come up with another law to try to counteract it. Well, then we saw there that, uh, uh, you know, the king signs it in effect. So sure enough, they find Daniel... Uh, praying because they knew he would so they're all stalking on his house and and um, they find him and then so then they go up and they tell the king there in verse 13 um, well verse 12 then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree has thou not signed a decree that every man shall ask a petition of any god or man within 30 days save of thee O king shall be cast into the den of lions 
king answered and said, Thing is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. So again, and even saying, and look, we cannot change that law. Verse 13. Then answered they and said before the king that Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. So they, they go home and they start ratting out Daniel, saying, look, you know, you, you, you agree you made this law, did you not, king? And I um, wanted to let you know that, hey, this, your, your buddy here, Daniel, you know, he, he's uh, not obeying it. So verse 14, Daniel chapter 6, verse 14. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. So when the king heard that Daniel was guilty of breaking this new law, then he was displeased with himself for being convinced by these people and assigning it into law. For he cared about Daniel and sought a way to rescue Daniel all day until the sun went down. So, you know, he finally... The light bulb clicks on. He's like, oh, what have I done? You know, that I didn't ever uh, ask Daniel. I just assumed that he was with all these guys, that I should have known that, you know, he was going to still worship his God. And so now basically I've condemned him to death. You know, so now he's worried because he liked Daniel. So he's, he's uh, you know, trying to figure out a way all, you know, until the sun goes down, what, what can I do? But remember, we just saw, you know, even the king himself had just said the verse before, uh, two verses before that the law cannot change so you know he would have to do something what as i mentioned like in esther where haman came up with the law that uh, they could kill all the jews well then they couldn't get rid of that so they had to come up with a thing where the jews could turn around and kill them you know and everybody could kill these people that were trying to kill the jews which still didn't really stop it but at least kind of helped counteract it some so, you know, he's trying to figure out something, you know, obviously, I guess he knows he can't change the law. So I guess he's trying to figure out some way to get around it or something. But either way, you know, he's kind of ticked off at himself for, uh, you know, having fallen for their little trap. So Daniel chapter 6, verse 15. Then these men assembled under the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is that no decree nor statute which the king establish, establisheth may be changed. So these men probably saw how the king was trying to rescue Daniel, so they assembled again before the king and reminded him that no decree issued by a king of the Medes and Persians could be changed in any way. Even when they could see that the king did not want to kill Daniel, then they continued to push the king to do so, showing how evil these men were. You know, so obviously we could see that they had a, an agenda here, purpose. They just purposely wanted, I mean, it wasn't even to just get, get Daniel out of power. They wanted this man destroyed. They wanted him dead. You know, they, they, he was just a eyesore to them. You know, it was just this old man trying to tell them what to do and whatever. And they wanted to get rid of him, you know, which shows, you know, and, and they, again, they tried to remind the king. Now, king, now you know, I, I could see you're being troubled here, but. Remember, you know, we have a law that once you make a law, you can't change it. You know, so they keep reminding them that, you know, this can't be changed. But like I said, they're very, very evil men. You know, the king should have right there and then just thrown them all in at the same time. But Daniel chapter 6, verse 16. Then the king commanded and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. You know, remember, I spoke about this, but it's not a lion's den. It's a den of lions because the den of lions actually shows there's lions in there. Where a lion's den, they may not be there. So the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. So the king then commanded that Daniel be brought to him, and he be cast into the den of lions as the law required. Now, he knew he could not change the law, and so he had to fulfill it even if he did not want to. The king told Daniel that the God he served continually would protect him and deliver him from the lions. Now, notice how the king himself knew that Daniel never stopped serving God. And he understood that this was why he was being cast into the den of lions in the first place. You know, it says up here, you know, Thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. So, you know, this heathen king understood that God would not fail his servant Daniel who never stopped serving him. 
You know, would the king be able to say that about us? You know, you, you wonder, you know, here it is, this, uh, you know, this heathen king, you know, he understood that Daniel, no matter what, you know, I made this law, he knew that it would it'd mean his death, but he didn't care. He was going to continue to serve his God no matter what. And, you know, he, he, to him, that was just more important. He didn't care because, you know, whether Daniel thought he would be delivered or not, or just like whatever, I don't care. At least I get to be home with the Lord. You know, I, I don't, you know, who knows. But he just met a what, even if it meant his death. You know, because the thing is, it doesn't always mean that God's going to deliver people. Sometimes God delivers Christians in certain situations. Other times he allows them to be killed, you know, let them come home. So, you know, it doesn't mean that, you know, we see stories here. We saw where his three friends got delivered in the burning, fiery furnace. But it doesn't mean they're always going to get, you know, Christians are always going to get delivered. Sometimes, I mean, Christians get martyred all the time all over the world. And sometimes God allows it for whatever reason. Sometimes he saves them. So, you know, but this, this key thing king, you know, he knew that Daniel was never going to stop serving, you know, his God, no matter what. You know, and as I said, you know, would the king be able to say that about us? You know, I, I don't think that could be said about too many people today. That, um, you know, even in Daniel's time, I mean, that, you know, there's very few people that are as loyal as Daniel was to God. That, um, you know, most people, push come to shove, they're not going to be remaining that loyal. And so, but it's just sad when, you know, the thing is, though, that's why I say that it, what gets me is the heathen, you know, here it is. The, the king knew this stuff about Daniel and, you know, cared about Daniel, obviously. But yet he was dumb enough to go and hurry up, make this law. Like I said, didn't even talk to Daniel or anything else. That's what gets me. But so he, he's... Um, you know, he knew he had to go through with the law because, you know, fulfilling it because, you know, like I said, he couldn't change it. So he's like, I have to go through with it, you know. But, you know, whether he'd been praying himself or whatever, but, you know, they were asking, like, Lord, I don't even know who you are, but, you know, look, Daniel's your servant and, you know, take care of him, whatever. But, you know, he goes to Daniel and he tells him, he says, you know, Daniel, I have to fulfill this, but I know, I trust that your God is going to protect you because he, you know, you serve him daily. So why would he let you down? So, you know, the king, the king had enough faith that he really truly believed, I think, that Daniel would be protected. Well, look at verse 17, Daniel chapter 6, verse 17. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. So a, st a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, sealed after Daniel had been cast into it. Now it was sealed with the, the king's signet. You know, that was the, like the ring that they always would wear. And then it had a little, uh, you know, like every king usually always has uh, uh, like a crest or whatever. I can't think of the name for it. But, you know, they, they all have their own little symbol. So, you know, like, well, this was for King George. This was for, you know, King... Uh, you know, like we have King Charles there over in the United Kingdom now, whatever. You know, whoever the king was, King Henry or something. Then you, they each one had, you know, so you knew, you know, which one it was. So, you know, okay, we got more than one King George. Was, was it the first or the third? Well, this, you know, this shows who it was. And when you put this on there, like they would take and they would seal it in like a, probably some kind of like a putty type stuff. So that, that uh, everybody could see it's been sealed with the king. You know, this has been, you know, the. The king has given authority for this to be done. And, you know, if anybody were to mess with it, then, you know, they're going to be getting in trouble because, you know, you're messing with the, what the king has, has done. So, you know, once once this was done, that was kind of like him saying the same, same thing that, you know, that, you know, it makes that law. Once I've signed it, it's in law. Well, once I seal it, you cannot touch that until, you know, I say so or whatever. But as I said, so it was sealed with the king's signet and also those of his lords shown that no one could open it up without the king's permission so that the decree would be filled. So, you know, not only did the king sign it, but each of his lords, you know, the ones underneath him, of course, you know, they're the ones that are behind all this stuff, so they're going to be happy to, to sign it. So it was kind of showing that extra grip. But, you know, they also would do these seals so that it also showed you could see if somebody tried to break in there. You, you can see if that seal's broke. You know, it's kind of like you see on, on, like, bottles or something today. You know, they have that seal. If it's been broken, then you know, okay, well, somebody's been in here. It's been tampered with. Well, same thing with this. You know, that was with, like, when they buried Jesus. You know, you'd have, 
you know, a, a seal on it. And you can see, well, if that seal's been broken, you know somebody's, you know, tampered with it or whatever. Where if it's perfectly, you come back there days later and it's still, you know, sealed up, you know, nobody's messed with it. Nobody's come in, nobody's come out or anything else. Look at Daniel chapter 6, verse 18. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. So the king then went to his palace after sealing Daniel in the den and fasted and did not eat during the night. Now the king did not allow instruments of music to be brought before him to entertain him, and he was unable to sleep. You know, so you know, back in those days, obviously you didn't have TV, you didn't have all the things like that. So, you know, a lot of times the kings would have people come in there and they'd play music for them or whatever, especially like when it was time to get ready to go to bed and it'd help them fall asleep, I guess, or whatever. And so, you know, but just to entertain them, like, well, I got nothing else to do except put on my thumbs. So you guys come in here and play some music for me and stuff. But he didn't even allow that because he was depressed. He's like, yeah, I got to figure out something here. You know, I'm, I'm worried about Daniel. So, you know, the king, he didn't even allow anybody to entertain him. He didn't want to be happy. You know, he was sad right now because his little friend Daniel was, uh, you know, he wasn't, I mean, I, he wasn't 100% sure that he was going to survive. I mean, I think he kind of believed he would be, but he still didn't really know. But so he was, you know, um, because of his worrying and all that stuff, you know, he was unable to sleep. Now, if you remember, in Esther, the same thing happened to the king there. You know, he, he um, one night was unable to sleep. And that's when the, the, the scribes came in there and they started reading all the, the scrolls to him of all the, uh, the chronicles of, uh, you know, they always write everything down for the kings and stuff. You know, this is what happened today, Lord. And, you know, and then so they can go back and look, you know, two years later. Let me, what happened on this date two years ago? Well, let me look. Well, that was the day. Oh, Mordecai, he, he, uh, he saved your life, Lord. He, he ratted on, you know, told you about some people that wanted to kill you. And so, you know, you had them executed. And then he's like, well, what do we ever do to Mordecai? Oh, well, we didn't do anything, you know, king. So, you know, then that kind of sets the whole stage and so forth. And eventually going to lead to Haman's death. But the same way, you know, God purposely planned that so that he could not sleep, so that he would find out about Mordecai. So that way Mordecai would end up getting elevated and, and so forth. Well, now here it's the same thing. The king's not able to sleep. So, you know, and I'm quite sure that was done by God. So Daniel, but it's, it's, again, it's just sad that a heathen king cares that much about somebody like this, but yet, at the same time, doesn't, you know, try to serve Daniel's guy. But Daniel chapter 6, verse 19. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. So the king then got out of bed early in the morning and hurried to the den of lions to check on Daniel. You know, notice over and over in Scripture, people always get up early. They go early and they go and do something. But this king, I mean, he couldn't sleep anyway. So, you know, boom, daylight comes. Whatever. He's gone. He's getting up. He's like, I'm going to hurry and run to the... Because the thing is, nothing ever said in the law just said they had to be cast into the den of lions. It never said, you know, they had to stay in there for 24 hours. They had to stay in there for a certain amount of time. So, obviously, and most people are figuring, well, you know, it wouldn't matter. You throw him in there for an hour. It ain't going to matter that he should have been already dead. So, I mean, the people, I'm sure they weren't necessarily going to be, you know, expecting to find Daniel, so they weren't really going to care. But the king, at that point, he, he goes there. He's going to hurry and check on Daniel. You know, he has the authority at that point. So Daniel chapter 6, verse 20. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee? From the lions. So the king went to the den and shouted in a lamentable or mourning voice to Daniel and asked him if, his, if as the servant of the living God who he served, whom he served continually, was he able to save and deliver him from the lions. So the, um, you know, the king, he's go there and, you know, and he's, remember, he's in mourning because, you, you, you know, he's, um, saddened over you know the possibility that Daniel's dead you know like I said he, he cared for him and you know he I think there's a part of him that like I said thinks that he's still alive but it was also a part like well like I said there's no guarantee that you know he would be so you know he's crying to him out you know shout loudly but in this 
mourning voice. You know, this wasn't like a happy voice. You know, he was sad, like in a sad voice. And so, you know, and he asked me, he's like, oh, Daniel, are you still alive? Would, you know, the God you serve continually, was he able to deliver thee, <laughs> you know, from these lions? But now the king, again, as I said, mentions how Daniel continuously served God and how he served the living God. I think he understood his gods were dead. The king was hoping that Daniel would be alive and answer him back. You know, so we see that not only does he say, you know, whom thou servest continually, you know, he says, uh, servant of the, you know, the Daniel's the servant of the living God. And, that, you know, he serves him continually. That, you know, was he able to deliver him? So again, we see we see some things about the king, but again, it always makes me wonder, like, well, why don't these people that ever get saved then or whatever? You know, they see these things that, you know, who knows what happened later on, but but we see that, um, you know, the king is wise enough to see that Daniel serves a living God. I mean, I think he reality, you know, I think most of them do, they understand that the gods they serve, they're not they're not living, they're they're dead, you know, and so. You know, he he um, he's thinking. Well, you know, Daniel's God's a lot different than than theirs. You know, that if anybody can can save him, it'd be be his God. But then, verse twenty one, Daniel chapter six, verse twenty one. Then said Daniel unto the king, "O king, live forever." So Daniel told the king to live forever. You know, like I said, they always said, that, "Oh, king, live forever." You know. So now that was his way of answering back that you know I'm fine. That you know, king, live forever. You know, in other words, he's also trying to sh tell the king that you know. Daniel, I think that was Daniel's way of trying to say that, you know, I'm not mad at you, King. You were just, you know, you got tricked and, and um, you know, you just had to fulfill the law. But, you know, you didn't intend to necessarily harm me that, um, you know, he didn't go and ask me like, you know, hey, why were you being stupid and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, I think that was his way of trying to, you know, not blame the king for, for what was going on. But. So Daniel chapter 6, verse 22. My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lions' mouth, mouths, that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him innocent was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. So Daniel tells the king that God sent his angel to shut the lions' mouths so that they would not hurt him because God knew innocency was found in him. Daniel says he was innocent before God. And also before the king, for which he had done no harm to him. You know, so he's telling him that, look, you know, he says, oh, king, live forever. And he's telling him that, yes, king, that, you know, my God did send an angel and, you know, he shut the lions' mouths. And, you know, so they were unable to hurt me, you know. And so because God knew that there was, you know, I was innocent of everything. You know, I didn't do anything other than I was praying to him. I was praying to, to God. So, you know, there was, I, you know, even the people themselves said that they could find no fault in Daniel. So, you know, Daniel's saying that, look, I'm not in here because of anything that, you know, God didn't find any fault in me. And also that, that you know, King, I never did anything, any harm to you. You know, I've always tried to be there. Remember, that was why they had the three presidents in the first place over the 120 princes. It's so that they could keep harm from the king, it says, that, uh, in other words, you know, that they would, these princes would have to report back to these three presidents. And, you know, probably then they ultimately went to Daniel since he was the top. But at the very least, you know, they get back. And so, like, if they're saying something going on, like, hey, we heard about something such going on. This is going to look bad for the king. All right, well, you guys take care of it. Make sure it happens. So the king don't find out anything about it, you know, whatever. You know, so, it, you know, they do that, you know, even with the presidency or something. And then, they tr you, you know, theoretically, you have these people that try to handle situations so it doesn't make the president look bad. You know, the media is good about that. They try to suck up to the satanic individual that we, we call himself now the president. But uh, they go and they try to, um, you know, spin everything to make it look like he, he's uh, this great individual when he's pure, pure evil is all he is. But, you know, so they're, they're trying to keep harm from the president. And that's what these men would do. So, you know, they would, you know, and, and Daniel's saying, look, you know, I've never done anything to you to hurt you. Well, let's look at verse 23. So Daniel chapter 6, verse 23. Then was the king exceeding glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. 
So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no manner of hurt was found upon him, because he believed in his God. So the king was glad to hear that Daniel was unharmed, and commanded that they take Daniel out of the den, up out of the den. Now Daniel was taken up out of the den as ordered by the king, and no harm or injuries were found on Daniel. Now Daniel was not harmed because he believed in his God. Daniel never wavered from God, even if he thought it would cost him his life. And for this, God protected him. You know, God will do the same for us. Now again, you know, it says here that God, you know, Daniel was saved because he believed in God. Now again, it doesn't mean that automatically, oh, that, well, you know, this, this missionary or something like that, they died because they didn't believe in God. No, sometimes, like I said, God just doesn't always, he, sometimes he allows Satan to get the upper hand and he, he takes the person home. Other times he will protect him and everything. You know, that, you know, you hear these stories of people how when they were trying to get away from the communists or things like that, and, and um, you know, God protected him in certain ways. Sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. But, you know, in this case here, Daniel... You know, it was almost, you know, in one sense, God didn't have to do anything, but it, it just make, you know, would look, make him look bad, or even, or even the king's like, oh, you know, you serve him continually, you know, and, you know, I, I know that your God will protect you, but then, if, you know, if he didn't, you know, if he allowed Daniel to die, you know, here it is, it's like, you know, potentially, you know, the king could get saved or something, and, and um, you know, it was almost one of those things that, you know, I want to say God had to do something, because God don't have to do anything, he doesn't want to, but it would just look certainly bad if he did not but but I think it was just because Daniel was such a loyal man to him that you know he did deliver him from from harm here you know and like I said Daniel never wavered from God even if he thought it would cost him his life you know and I think that that's the difference too is that Daniel like you said he knew that as soon as he heard that law I go and pray it's going to cost me my life but I'm not going to change I'm not going to change who I am I'm not going to change you know, what we're supposed to do, you know, that I need to serve God. You know, that was more important to him than his life. Like you said, that should be for every Christian that, that you know, your life, if you're saved, you're going to heaven anyway. So what, what difference does it make? I mean, who wants to live on this pathetic earth nowadays anyway when it's so full of sin and stuff? So, you know, he, he, he wasn't worried about it costing him his life. He was going to remain loyal no matter what. But now we also see from this verse that the den alliance was in a hole and not a flat cave with a rock in front of it as shown in some pictures. It says he was taken up out of the den, not from the den. You know, you see various pictures of, you know, it's supposed to be Daniel and the den alliance and, and they'll show some lines there, different things. And, and uh, you know, sometimes you see mapping on them or whatever, but. You know, they usually show it where it's, you know, like a cave opening, and then it's just like he's in there in this flat ground. But that's not what it was. You know, he was basically thrown, you know, either went at an angle or whatever, but, you know, it says down. You know, he, he had, you know, he was down like in this hole. And so, um, you know, it probably was literally like a hole, and they somehow or another like pushed the lines down there or whatever. You know, they have to jump or something, but. You know, you know, this was not flat. This was like a hole, and then they covered it up because it says, you know, he came up out of the den. You know, so you can't come up out of something that's flat. So, but we'll pick it up in verse 24 next week, and we'll continue on. And uh, like I said, we'll, we'll finish up with Daniel here in the, the den alliance. So let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time you've given us here to once again come and worship you. We thank you, Lord, that, that you are the living God, as even this heathen King Darius was uh, able to see. And that we know, Lord, that, that you people there and they serve you daily, that you will look after us just like you looked after Daniel. And that doesn't mean that eventually you're not going to take us home, that, you know, that, that there isn't going to become a time where you just... Um, like I said, it's not that you don't protect us, but, you know, to our benefit that we go home. And so, Lord, we thank you for that, that you are, are loyal to us in the same way that you do look after your servants. And so, Father, we just pray that you'll continue to be our God. We thank you that, as I said, we do serve a living God, 
and not like these heathen who, who serve dead gods. You know, they're dead. They're gods, as you say in Scripture. They can't talk. They can't speak. They can't hear. They can't do anything. Like I said, they couldn't even. They fall over and they couldn't even pick themselves up like like in uh, the Philistines with Dagon. They had to go and pick their own god up. I mean, what kind of pathetic thing is that? That you want to serve something stupid as that? So. We thank you, Lord, that, that you're not like that. But, Lord, we pray that you'll continue to intervene in our lives. Just put that hedge around us. Keep the fiery darts of Satan away. Keep us all healthy and safe. And just continue to bring justice to this world where it's been done wrong. And you know the situations, Lord, on various things. We want to pray for those that need your healing touch. We just pray, Lord, that you'll bless each and every one that's here and listening online. And we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.